best choice as, as well. Okay? So it's a pure strategy. Now, for part C, the pure strategy, the optimal pure strategy is, is this one right here over one of these two, right? Because logic can, can show you this. In this case, at worst I'm going to tie, but I could win. In this one I'm guaranteed to tie. So this is a better solution than this one because if I don't have an intelligent opponent, I can do better than if I have an intelligent opponent. If I have an intelligent opponent, they're equally valid. But this is slightly a better strategy uh, if we account for non-intelligent behavior. Uh, question five. Um, question five was uh, tricky, I think, for a little bit because the picture I drew was not the network you needed to use. Okay? Because the network you needed to use, uh, the, the problem with this is you've got two connections going from this location to this location, and you need to be able to differentiate that in, in your final network. So the network that you need to be able to do uh, is you've got your laptop here, and it goes to maybe, you can think of this as being your Ethernet cable, and here it goes to your, your wireless um, modem, and then here it goes to your cell phone. If you, if you re-think about it in these terms, then it becomes easier to solve because now we go to our university router and then we come back here to our cloud. So this is the, the network that you had to use to solve this particular connectivity because uh, now we, have set, we don't have two connections from the same node to the same node, okay? And so you kind of have to see that you, you have to break out the, those two flows between the two. You can still use all your um, annotations here, um, 60 and 125. Uh, if you wanted to, probably the best thing to do is to set these to infinite because you've, you've added these, these nodes here. Um, and, and so, as much as you can possibly can is, is what you would, would put through here. Um, and then, this is the, the network that you, if you do the solution on, you'll get the, the, the full solution. Probably the most common flaw that uh, I saw in this problem is a shortest path solution rather than a maximum flow solution, right? We're, we're trying to figure out what the most stuff we can get through this network possible is. So a maximum flow is what we, we want to use to solve this problem. We don't want to figure out the shortest path through this because that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to do it quickly. We're trying to get most through. And so um, a few of you even put on your drawing this but then didn't incorporate that anywhere into your uh, model, uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, so this is really important because with our maximum flow, this, the capacity across this link is what we're trying to maximize. So if you don't include this, it's really hard to get the, the right final solution. Uh, so I'm going to label these numerically. One, two, three. Five, six. So then I can do the equations for here. Right? So again, because this is a network problem, we're going to have the common refrain we heard over and over again: inflow equals outflow. So the inflow to node one is what comes from cloud back to here, and that has to equal the outflow: x one two plus x one three plus x14. And you can do this for all the, the nodes. So x12 
has to equal x2 pi. And x13 has to equal x3 pi. So whatever comes in here has to come out. Whatever comes in here has to come out. Uh, almost done. x14 equals x45. And then x25 um, plus x35 has to equal x56. That gets our, our flow constraints, so we don't somehow leave data at some uh, spot. We, don't, we, don't, uh, we want to send it all the way through from our laptop to, to the internet here. Uh, and so that it gives us our flow constraint. We're gonna, our, our objective function is to maximize x61. And then the last thing we need to do is our capacity constraints. And we have these four capacity constraints. So x12 has to be less than or equal to 100. x13 has to be less than or equal to 54. x14 is less than or equal to 60. And x56 is less than or equal to 125. Right there. Some of you combine these together rather than keeping them separate. And that oftentimes did you poorly because then you forgot to include some or all of the, the capacity or the flow constraints as a result. And this one was worth 10 points. Okay, problem, last problem of the test, problem six. Um, this is a transshipment problem you've been told, so you need to get the uh, network diagram here. Um, by far, this was the one that um, uh, students lost the most points off of. Because you did not give me the full network diagram, you just gave me the, uh, the connections where a product was transferred between the supply through the transshipment to the, the final destination. So let's talk about how you would get the, the full um, solution and then apply it to this particular problem. So I'm going to give a different network that's a lot smaller as an example. So I'm just going to do this network as an example. Right here. All right, and I'm going to have a supply of 5 and um, 7, and I'm going to have um, 8 and 4. This one has equal demand, but uh, a, B, C, so if we think about how we would create a transshipment model for for this, we would have um, we want to minimize our cost. So how do we compute our cost? How do we compute our costs in this scenario? Sum of everything that you're sending, like the sum of what it costs to get from A to C. Okay, how do we compute that? Uh, the amount that we're sending times the cost of it. Right, so we also need a cost in here. And this is where a lot of people lost points, is there was no cost in your network. You didn't incorporate that. And you had to specifically look at the decision variables to find these costs because the decision variables are only going to be represented in our objective solution. Right? So we get um, the cost of going from A to C. I'll just do this. Plus the cost of going to B to C plus the cost of going C to D, plus the cost of going from C to E. 
right? And so these are coefficients in your objective function. You're explicitly going to get that in your objective value of your decision variables. That's what those represent right there. So you, you have to look in that part of your sensitivity analysis to be able to pull this part of the information uh, out of our, our model. Okay? Then, we have three types of constraints that we have to, to deal with. The first one are our supply constraints. In this case, because our supply is equal to demand, we're going to say that everything that's outgoing from A has to be equal to the supply at A. Everything that's outgoing from B has to equal the supply from B. Okay? Because your problem, I'll make this more like your problem here, and I'll make this 9. Now we have too much supply, not enough demand. That changes this from equals to less than or equals. Right? So you've got some constraint that has this, this less than uh, or equal characteristic there. And so you will see that in uh, the, the cells L2 through L5 are less than or equal to the cells E2 through E5. Alright? Next, we have our flow constraint. Everything that comes into C better go out of C. And so we have XAC plus XBC needs to equal XCD plus XD. Uh, C, E. Right? Everything coming into C has to go out of C. And so you see that in your sensitivity analysis in the next three lines where the J or I, J, and K uh, equal M, 9, 10, and 11. And then finally, we have the demand constraint. So everything that comes in to D has to be equal to our demand. And everything that comes into E has to equal our demand. <clears throat> and you see that in the last four constraints there. All right. So now that we know what our transshipment problem looks like, where we have our objective value and we have our different types of, of constraints that we're going for, now we can actually create our, um, our network that represents it. Um, and so let me just draw you what the... <coughs> so it looked like... Four nodes on the supply side, four nodes on the demand side, and three intermediate nodes. So, um, if you label these, Colorado, Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, Missouri, Iowa, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Texas. Um, and if you then looked at the connections between them, <coughs> uh, you can see this again in the decision variables because you know there's got to be a connection between each one of these things. So the, so the decision variables, not only do they give you the weights, but they give you all the connections between these different things. Um, and so what you would see uh, is
something that looked like this. And uh, notice that Colorado is not connected to Ohio. It's got an infinite uh, connection there. Uh, similarly, the diagram here looks like, and Ohio is not connected to Texas. There's an infinite cost there, but all the other intermediate values are connected to <coughs> all the other things. And I won't go through every link cost here, but just to, to give an example of a couple, Colorado to Missouri would be 1.09, and again, you get that from the decision variables, uh, or Ohio to, to Georgia would be 4.94, and so forth. So constrained, it's hard to put those numbers on and, and make it readable. Thank you to those of you who uh, got out your colored pencils. They made it a lot easier to, to read and understand what uh, you're connecting and how. So this is the, the network, uh, just to give you an uh, idea of how I graded it. Um, half a point for each of the following, for one for identifying the nodes, um, and uh, two points for correctly getting the right shape of the network, and then a half point for identifying uh, the correct values on, on each um, node. Okay. So um, if you only put in the connections between the different nodes that the product was sent, you ended up with like 5 out of 20 points on this problem. Because you didn't get any of the costs, and you didn't get the right shape, but you did get the right uh, nodes in the, in the graph. Alright? The supply for the most of you got, frankly, the one gotcha was here in Wisconsin. Um, some of you, instead of putting 1900 here, which was the, um, excuse me, the right-hand side value of the constraint, you, instead of putting that, put the final value, which was the amount of goods sent out of Wisconsin, not the supply that Wisconsin had available to it. Alright, and finally then, um, what, uh, for, for part C, you need to answer is that if we increase Pennsylvania, so they got one additional node, uh, one additional product, went from 900 to 901, you had to look at the shadow price of, of that value, and um, which was $4.94. So increasing this from 900 to 901 would increase your cost by $4.94, which is uh, exactly what it would take to, to send that additional product there. All right. That was me really trying to go quickly through the exam. We've got a few minutes left. I can answer uh, specific questions after we're done. Um, but uh, I wanted to just uh, let you know there is something that's on Moodle that says it will be due on Wednesday, but I don't think that makes sense since we haven't gotten over that. So I'll delay it for a day. It will be due on, on Friday as well, and we'll talk about that in, in class on Wednesday. Um, and so. Um, the other thing you need to do, of course, is your um, Friday project. So let me do two minutes on that. Um, on last Friday, you allocated counties to particular congressional districts. You should have already computed for each county what its vote was for the Republican and the Democrat for quite a number of different elections at this point. For Friday's uh, project, what you need to do is combine those two together, the data that you've collected with your allocation. So you're going to have uh, simulated uh, new elections with your congressional district allocations. 
So you, let's say you've got the data for last year, 2018, how selection. You know how much each of the different counties voted for the Republican and, and the Democrat. You're going to pretend that you've got a new magical allocation and that people would have voted the same. And I know that's not true because um, sometimes candidates actually do matter in elections. Uh, and so, um, not always. Uh, sometimes they do, and so um, votes would change depending upon um, those congressional districts. We'll ignore that uh, facet of reality, and we'll just assume that what people did vote last year wouldn't have changed if you changed your congressional districts and you had different people running in those congressional districts. So you would compute for the 2018 House results what would have happened if the allocation you said where County A was in Congressional District 1 and so was B and F and Congressional District 2 was made of C and D and so forth. Now you can figure out exactly how many people in each Congressional District would have voted for the Republicans and would have voted for the Democrats. So now you've got a new election result uh, for, for this. You know how many people for your proposed congressional districts would have voted Republican, how many people would have voted Democrat. Now you know how many representatives the Republicans and the Democrats would have uh, done with your particular allocation. Of course, um, it's not a good allocation because it breaks the law. Um, by not being contiguous, but it's, it gets you the mechanism you need in your spreadsheet to take an allocation and turn it into an election result. Okay, so that's what's due for Friday. Um, and then uh, we will begin honing our election uh, model so that the congressional districts actually do have to be contiguous. So we'll talk about how we modify our model to force that requirement on that. All right. Hope you guys have a, a good day, and I'll see you on Wednesday.